ever wondered which translation of the Bible you should be reading? That's what we'll talk about today. As stimulating as these sometimes can be, they're never intended to be a person's only Bible. And the reader needs constantly to check particularly eye-catching moments against a true translation or a commentary to make sure not too much freedom has been taken. Gordon Fee, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Do you know how hard it is to find a quote about Bible translation? Very hard. Today we're going to talk about Bible translations and which ones are good ones to read and how did we get here? How did we get to these Bible translations that we have? What are the real differences? And as a guide, we're going to be using Why Should I Trust the Bible? Answers to Real Questions and Doubts People Have About the Bible by William D. Mounts. We talked about this book in the past, and it's just such a great book when you have questions about how did we get the books we wanted? What about those tricky passages that aren't exactly correct? And can we trust the Bible to be our source of information, inspiration? Is it God's word? He has been a part of the ESV translation and the NIV translation team. So his experience with Bible translation is pretty top notch, but he gives a very good explanation in this book what the different translations are and what exactly does it mean to have a good Bible translation. Thought it was fascinating. Then next week, we'll pick up the conversation and then go over each of the translations with a little bit more detail about where they came from and what their strengths and weaknesses are. He asks the question, can we trust our translations? And that's a really tricky question. The translations are so different. How can we see passages that say one thing in one translation and another thing in another translation? And does that mean one is wrong and one is right? He brings up a really good point that the fact is, is that other languages are not codes. It's not like Morse code where if I typed in hello from Jill, I would be typing in the words word for word in Morse code. Other languages are other languages. They have phrases we don't have. They have words we don't have. I saw that there were Inuit people who have hundreds of words for the word snow. You know, we might say ice and snow and grapple and some other terms when it comes to snow, but we don't have hundreds of words for snow. And what happens when you come across a word that doesn't have a direct translation in English or it lost its meaning? One of the interesting things he talks about in this, and we'll get to it later, is that there were idioms back in the day that no longer exist. So what do we do about this? How can we give a translation that's trustworthy, accurate, literal, or meaning what the text actually meant? And because he has so much great experience in actually translating the Bible, he gives some very detailed answers to how these translations come by. He says that sometimes, too, that these translations can be so different, it feels like they're being contrary to each other. Then there's the whole matter of fact of opinion about what you think the Bible is. Is it the direct word of God? Is it a summary of the word of God? It all gets wrapped up into this. In a sense, he says that the only way to really read the Bible, then if you want to know the original meaning or the original words, is to know Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek. In fact, he mentions that when you're a Muslim, they say you have to read the Quran in Arabic. Translations aren't even allowed. And then comes the question, even if you're trying to get the words right and the meaning right, sometimes when we talk about words that'll say a brother, but maybe it means brother and a sister because it actually means they. So if we say our brothers in Christ, does it mean our brothers and sisters in Christ? Probably. So then you have to go and find out exactly what the word meant, even if it's the same word over and over. I know my time when I was in Israel, I got pretty good at conversations with people in Hebrew, but it certainly lacked. I made my fair share of mistakes. 
I asked someone once where the Mediterranean Sea was, and boy, I think I said a bad word because he looked at me kind of funny when I asked him the question. So even if you get good at a language, it doesn't mean that you say things exactly the right way or use it in exactly the right context. So it's very difficult when we're trying to figure out. Mentions other times when he talks about the Bible when it says saints. Does that mean everybody? Does that mean everybody who's a follower of Christ? Does it mean the people who are pastors? We have to find out what those meanings are when we're digging into Bible translation. And he says that what they found when they're translating the Bible is he said that they have a semantic range, which means that the word itself can mean many different things. And you have to use the context of the word in order to figure out what exactly it meant. He gives the example of servant, slave, bond servant. That would be more like someone who put themselves in the service of a house to pay off a debt or to get something that they were looking to get. So then when Timothy say that they're servants of Christ, do they mean slaves of Christ, bond servants, or just plain servants? So now we have to interpret what exactly they meant. He says that the phrase from John eleven thirty five, where it says Jesus wept, actually translates more to Jesus burst out into tears. When he said Paul was wrecked on Malta and talked about the indigenous people, he said that, do we call them islanders, native? Native people, local inhabitants, people of the island. It's just, when you look at these languages, he talks about, again, the servant and the slave, there's no direct translation for it. And so we have to look in context. Many times when we see slavery in the Bible, it's talking about bond servant, which means it's someone who has a debt to pay off or they wanted something and they would get this thing if they worked X many years. Think about Jacob and how he worked all those years to get first Leah and then Rachel. That would be more like a bond servant as compared to a slave. When we talk about the Israelites in Egypt, it started out probably as a bond servant and moved into slavery. When we are talking about Paul, who was sending back a servant of Christ in Titus 1 1, it probably means a bond servant as well. And we can tell by the context of the way he was talking. We have to be very careful because a lot of times, too, that people will get upset about what it is you say. And so we want the Bible to be accurate in text, but we also want it to be accurate in meaning, too. He even brings up Psalm 23, 4, one of our most famous passages. Yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. In King James Version, it says that. And also, he says in ESV and NASB. But the problem is, is that the two Hebrew words that lie behind the valley of the shadow of death actually really mean the valley of gloom. So where did we get the idea of death from? And is it just that he was feeling lonely, left behind, forgotten? Or did he really feel like he was on the verge of death? We've been talking about simple words, but what if they're complex ideas? When we talk about the fact that Christ died on the cross for our sins, NASB says propitiation. RSV says expiation. And the difference is significant, he says. The translators for NIV felt that the terms were too hard to understand. I mean, I don't know what those words mean. Until you start explaining what they mean, it's hard to know. And aren't you reading the Bible so that you know what it is that Jesus did for us and what we're supposed to do. And so then comes the phrase atoning sacrifice. And so do we want a word that expresses to people what it really means that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, or do we want a more theologically accurate word, even if it doesn't mean anything to most people? So that's why it is so hard to get a translation right. And the various translations deviate from each other about how they tried to put the words. And in examining that very interesting phrase, it talks about how the nations of Israel used to sacrifice for the sins with actual sacrifices. 
but then Jesus comes and does the sacrifice for us. And so if we have to choose between propitiation and expiation, theologically they're different. And so then how do we get this exactly right? He also brings up the good point, and I always learned this when I was taking Hebrew as well, is that Jesus was born of a virgin. The word is also a word for maiden, which just means a young woman, an unmarried woman. But in those days, a young unmarried woman was a virgin. So it makes sense to go to that degree. And so that's where it becomes important to become logical about how we translate the words. Then comes just the grammar. We put words in a various pattern in English, right? We have the subject, and the subject did a verb, and then we describe the verb, who we did the verb to, or in what manner was that done. But that's not how it is in most languages. I took Celtic a few decades ago. And when you say, I am from Chicago, you would say something more like, my mother was from Chicago, which means that's where you're from because that's where your mother was from. So, you know, even if you get the phrases right, it's not exactly clear. He talks about the parable of the prodigal son. And when his father saw his son, he ran to his son and then, quote, fell on his neck. This is Luke 15, 20. What does it mean to fall on someone's neck? Sort of reach them and sobbing and you grab them by the neck and hug them. You don't actually fall on their neck. You're putting your arms around their neck in love. Because he talks a little bit about Paul and Paul says something and it doesn't come out as strongly because Paul says in Romans 6.15, what then, shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. That was in King James Version. But it's not so calm like that. He would be yelling, screaming, exclamation marks, because it's a very strong phrase. How can we get that phrase to have the strength it meant to have? I even noticed, because I like listening to the Bible on audible books, and there's a translation. Even if you're listening to a translation you're used to, even in audible books, because what if the person reads something as maybe a little bit sly? I remember there was something that um, Jesus was saying. And the reader of it took it that Jesus was being a little playful, a little a little mocking of his apostles. And I thought, oh, he's kidding here. He's not being serious about this. But that is the interpretation of the person who's reading it. Even if it's in a translation, we recognize. And he even goes into the question about what do you do for Chinese Bible? Because the Chinese language doesn't have plurals. So you don't have two boats. You would say to boat, which essentially is a way of substituting the idea of having a plural. So now we have to make sure that we're right for other languages. He gave an example of when he was speaking German. He said, I am cold, which is not what you say when you're telling someone that you're chilly. You're saying, to me, it is cold. That is the proper way you say cold. If you say you're hot or you say you're cold, that's a There's a whole other meaning there. All languages are complicated when it comes to translating them. But I think the work is well worth it. We talked about in the past about how Tyndale brought it to the English language. Before then, you had to trust people who could read the original language, not only to translate it correctly, but also to tell you everything. If you had someone who was your pastor or priest in your church, and they didn't want to tell you certain passages because it kind of convicted them of what they've been doing, or they want to tell you, hey, God says you should listen to me, and I'm telling you to do this, so go listen to me. If you don't read the whole passage, you could be only hearing part of the truth. And so that's where it becomes impossible for the regular Christian, regular Bible reader, It makes it impossible for the regular church attendee to know what they're supposed to do because you're counting on that other person to not only translate it correctly, but to tell you everything. And quite often they didn't. When you saw the Bible in ancient times, they were just some passages, not all the passages, 
And that's where Luther got in trouble. That's where Tyndale got in trouble. Because for the first time, mere regular people could read it for themselves and not just read some of it, but read all of it. He says, too, it gets complicated also because you'll see that language doesn't have the same structure. For example, he says that Greeks have very long sentences and English has shorter sentences. And he gives the example of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, which is one sentence in Greek. But when we divide it up in ESV, it's five. In NIV, it's eight. And in NLT, it is 15. So we also have to decide where to end sentences. Not only that, we put in chapter and verses. Those don't exist in the Bible. These are letters. These are books. There's no chapter and verses. And we did so so that we could say, hey, Bob, go read chapter two, verse one, you know, and then you could indicate what you're reading from so that we can all be at the same place. But those places were made up by people. Someone gave me an interesting exercise once when I was working at InterVarsity handed me a Bible that had no chapter and verses in it. It was a gigantic binder. I wonder if I even have it still. But he said, this is how it was meant to read. These are stories from beginning to end. They're not supposed to have chapter marks. They're not supposed to have verses. And sometimes when we end a verse at a certain place, it looks like a closure that was never meant to be there in the first place. And it could give us an entirely different understanding if we think, oh, now there's a new chapter. He's talking about something else. Maybe not. So then we have that complication. He says in the end that there's different ways to try to interpret the Bible. They said that there's the functional view or the dynamic view, which means that when we try to look at the original meaning, We're looking at the author's intent of the story. We're trying to use that language and translate the Bible in such a way that we get to the original meaning of exactly what's being said. And so he says ESV is considered to be a formal equivalent, which means we're going to try to translate the best we can word for word, while a dynamic equivalent is where we try to be a little bit more about getting the meaning of the word, maybe be a little less actual literal about what we say, but trying to get at the heart of what's being said. And so he gives the example of John 3.16. If we were to say, well, we want a literal translation, and that's what they call the interlinear translation, if we were to read it in actual Greek, it would say, in this way, for he loved the God the world, in order each believing into him, not that he may perish, but that he might have life eternal. And so we translate, we drop some of the letters, we drop some of the words because that sentence doesn't mean a lot to us. We just simply say, because God so loved the world, whoever believes, you know, so that's where the difficulty comes, even from a very simple phrase We can't translate it word for word or it wouldn't mean a lot to us. He says NLT will translate it, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son. And there's a colon in there to express that sentence as being together. So that's where we say, if we ask, I want a literal translation of the Bible. It's probably not what you're really looking for. The inner linear Bible will give you that, but it'll be so difficult to read, you won't actually get the real meaning of the sentence. You'll just get translated words word for word. So that's where he said that you want to be transparent when you're doing translations and look at concordances and other resources so that you have what they say are formal equivalents. That means you're going to translate a word so it actually makes sense, even if it isn't the exact word for word. Can we get to the same meaning that we have while trying to get to the same word, following the same structure of Greek, but doing the best we can? And he gives the example of 1 Timothy 1 through 8. There is a pun in what he said, 
And I've heard this too, that there's even places in the Old Testament where they're jokes or they're poems, and we don't get it because we're looking at it at a different language. NLT actually maintains the pun and says, now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. See, he's, it's, a, it's a play on words. And so while it's not exactly what was said, the pun in ESV is captured. But in NIV, it just says, we know the law is good if one uses it properly. Doesn't quite capture exactly what was being said in kind of the sly way or the interesting way that it was said in Timothy. So he says for functional or dynamic equivalents, that's again where we're going to look for words. We may skip words. We may skip punctuation and translate it in such a way that we can understand what is going on. And he says, even here, the language is not English. There could be idioms in place. There could be other structures in place that won't be word for word, even though it's being a little dynamic. It's still trying to stick as closely as it can to the original words. But then the passage gets strange. We don't know what it means. The English is clunky, so we are not able to understand it. And so we get in stuck in that. He says that Matthew 10, 29, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? And he says, well, what does apart from your father mean? Does it mean far away? Does it mean the father doesn't see it? Does it mean that it's without our father's wishes or consent? So now it's complicated because now we don't even know what it means to fall apart from our father. And that's where he says, like, NLT will try to have a dynamic translation so that it'll help you understand exactly what is meant. He says, quote, the beauty of the natural language is easy to understand, and you don't have to walk around with a dictionary and try to look up everything that's being said, because when we look at NLT, we'll be able to understand exactly what it meant. So when he talks about ESV and NIV, They're trying to be true to the Greek in their varying degrees. They're trying to be true to the meaning as best they can. But NLT, if it has the ability to make it better understood, but not exactly translating the word for word or the exact word, it'll do so trying to err on the side of understanding. But he says, then you run into the trouble when you have a natural language translation like NLT, is trying to make it in a more natural language, then the words might be wrong. And then you might get the wrong idea about where it's going. And then he gives a passage of Acts 27, 17, where it talks about capitalizing the word Syrtis. They ran aground, and so we understand that it's a place. We don't know this place. We've never heard of this place. And NLT, because it's trying to help you understand, it'll say, They were afraid of being driven across the sandbars of Syrtis off the African coast. African coast is added because that's not said. But we didn't know what it was. But now, because they said it, we get it. He says that there are certain phrases in the Bible that we just don't understand. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles was probably talking about a Roman law that said a soldier has a right to make you carry his pack for a mile. And if the soldier demands you carry his pack for a mile, carry it for two miles, meaning go above and beyond. But we don't know that that's a Roman practice. And we have other words that are just phrases of the language itself. He mentions that in Exodus, it talks about God being long-nosed. What does that mean? Long-nosed? means patient, but it's an idiom of ancient Aramaic, and we don't know what that means because it's just not a part of our language. So we're going to go ahead and stop here. We'll talk about translations and a little bit more about the individual translations and where they try to place themselves in the Bible. So my challenge to you is if you have a chance to look at a couple of different Bible translations, maybe you have a couple of different Bibles in your house, King James and NIV or other translations, try to look up some key passages, maybe some of your favorite passages, and compare them 
translation to translation. Think about how it may change your viewpoint of what you're reading based on how the translation goes. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. But here's the thing I'm thinking about. I've always wanted to do a deep dive into the Bible, not just read it, not just have it told to me, you know, in an audio book or something like that. And I'm pondering about doing a little bit of a Bible study. I'm not going to read the Bible to you. So the idea is that you're going to read a chapter a day, and then we're going to talk every day about the chapter we read. But I'm going to create a template, and we're going to talk about the same aspects of every Bible passage in the Bible. I'm thinking we'll start with the New Testament. I would love to start it right away, but I think when we're talking about the birth of Jesus, wouldn't it be better if we started it in December? If you have any thoughts about this, if you have ideas of how we can make this work better, please let me know. You can email me at jillatsmallstepswithgod.com, or you can find me on Twitter. But I'm really interested to hear if you're interested in doing this kind of Bible study together. Have a wonderful week. And remember, working our way through the Bible.